Okay, uh, what we're going to do now, you see I've already built this, but uh, we're going to uh, talk about using switches, interfacing switches to the Arduino. Uh, this is pretty basic, it's something you're going to want to do a lot uh, in order to control things. Uh, and even when you're not using switches, you may have sensors that act like switches. First thing I'm going to do is introduce the concept of a schematic diagram. Schematic is a way of sketching electronic circuits uh, just using symbols and uh, it lets you uh, plan what you want to do uh, before you actually start to build it. This is the circuit that we built at the beginning of the f last section, which is just an LED. This is an LED. You see the uh, arrow with the line on it there is a diode. If you draw a circle around it and then have the arrows leading away from it, that indicates that it's a light-emitting diode. That's the, supposed to be the light leaving it. The re resistor, this is a resistor. The squiggly line uh, sort of graphically represents the fact that the electricity has a harder time going through there, uh, which is why it's called a resistor. It resists the flow of uh, electricity. Uh, this is uh, a symbol that represents a battery or a voltage source of some sort. Now, this is just simplistically how we are going to set up the circuit. Uh, the the LED on top here is set up uh, like we did on the, at the end of the last one, where we just have pin 13 going out to an LED into a resistor and then coming around down to here and going into the ground. So pin 13 goes high, the circuit, the voltage goes through like this, pin 13 goes low, and uh, this and this are both ground, current can't flow. What we're going to do now is add a couple of switches. Uh, you can do, you can have the software do whatever you want to uh, with the switches. Uh, I'm just going to have them speed up and slow down the uh, blinking, uh, just as a simple example. Um, conceptually, what we do is we take a switch. This represents a switch that can open and close. Uh, when it's open, it's like it's not connected. When it's closed, it is connected. You take one of the pins uh, of the Arduino. You programmatically tell the Arduino that you want that to be an input pin rather than an output pin. And again, you do want to be careful of that because if you program that as an output pin, set it to high and then close the switch, you're shorting, the, the Arduino is trying to supply power uh, to it and you're shorting it straight to ground and you could actually damage the Arduino. If you set it as an input pin, then it doesn't uh, do that. Uh, so then what happens is when you, when you uh, close the switch, it pulls it down low. Now the problem is that uh, as it says here, these pins are just floating around. If you just say these are inputs, uh, the Arduino just lets them float around to wherever it wants to. It's not driving them in any way. Uh, this is set as an output pin, so it's being hard driven in a way that can actually deliver drive current out enough to run an LED or even like a possibly a a very small motor or something like that. Uh, these are not delivering any current. Uh, the problem with that is that you really don't know, you're hoping that this thing would be high until you close the switch and then that would pull it low. Well, it's not necessarily going to be because you're, it's just floating around. It could be high, it could be low, it could be whatever. Luckily there's, uh, normally what you would do here is you would then install a resistor between the uh, this pin and plus five volts. That would tend to pull this up high so that the Arduino would see uh, a high input on it. But the resistor, uh, when you then close the switch to pull it low, the resistor doesn't really deliver very much current and it would be easy for the switch to pull it back low again. This is called a pull-up resistor. 
You can also have pull down resistors if you want. If you wanted to have this switch connected to plus five volts over here, you could pull this down, and then when you close the switch, the it would go high. It doesn't really matter. It's just a matter of preference, or sometimes there's design constraints that make you do it one way or the other. Now, luckily, we don't even actually have to install the resistors because the Arduino can do that internally. Uh, under program control, if you set these to uh, inputs, and then you say, and then you write to them anyway, it doesn't actually write. Uh, it doesn't actually. Uh, deliver current, well not much current to it. If you set, if you write a 1 to a pin that's defined as an input, what it does is it turns on a pull-up resistor that's actually inside the Arduino chip. It's like a 10,000 ohm resistor. So it's enough to pull it up, but it's not going to draw very much current at all when you close this and, and force this pin to go back down low again. So here's the circuit that we have. Uh, these pins will appear to be low, or uh, sorry, will appear to be high until the switch is closed, and they will appear to be low. Uh, so it's a pretty simple circuit. Uh, now here's the software that we've done. Uh, you can see that before, if you remember, it said uh, it just had a 13 here, and it's a better practice in general to do this up on the top. Say con const just means constant. It's you don't have to do that. It it's up to you. You can do it or not. Const tells the software this thing is never ever going to change. It also tells you. It kind of is a reminder to yourself. This is a constant. It never changes. It's not allowed to change. In fact, it'll keep you from making mistakes later on if you accidentally try to s change the value of LED pin. Uh, the software will stop you from doing that. It'll generate an error when you try to compile the software. Um, so that's uh, the, the reason that you want to do this. You see I define LED pin, button 1, and button 2 pin. If at some point I decide that I need to change what pins things are attached to, well, we only have a few lines of code here. So it wouldn't be a big deal to go through and change these. But when you get to the point where you have hundreds or thousands of lines of code and you decide, well, yeah, button one was attached to pin two, but I need to attach it to pin six now. Well, you have to go through and find everywhere where, you, where your program says two and f decide whether that two means pin two or maybe you just needed to say two for something and it doesn't have anything to do with which pin a button is on and then change some of them to six and some of them not it gets very confusing and very uh, prone to making errors so if you just do this right at the beginning uh, then it also it's just easier to write this way you uh, don't have to remember which pin everything's hooked to anyway so here's our setup program our setup function we still have the same pin mode here except it says LED pin instead of 13 but LED pin is set to 13 up here. We've also added these two functions here pin mode button 1 pin and button 2 pin both set to input and then these two lines here digital write button 1 pin and button 2 pin to high as it says here turns on a pull-up resistor uh, so which we talked about already and this part of the function here is the same as it was before, except you also notice up here that instead of saying a thousand down here hard coded, uh, hard coded just means that it's a thousand is typed straight into there. Um, I've just set a, a value up here to a thousand. You notice this one does not say const because I'm going to change this value uh, as the program runs. Uh, so it delay whatever that's currently set to it'll wait that many milliseconds between each cycle and then it gets down to here where it will read the value of button one and if it's low and remember low means that uh, the button is pressed then it'll come down here and it'll subtract a hundred 
from the mil number of milliseconds it's waiting as long as the delay is, is greater than 100. So it won't go down to zero or negative values. Uh, this, that's what this line stops it from doing. And then we do the same thing. Button two is how we increase the delay, make the thing run slower. And that has an upper limit of 2,000. It won't let uh, the button delay or the flash delay get over two seconds, 2,000 milliseconds. Uh, the LED and everything up here is still the same as it was before. You'll just notice that I've taken a wire and attached it to one of the pins that's to the ground and brought it over and hooked it in to one side of the switch and then another wire goes over to one side of the other switch and then one wire comes over goes to pin two and one wire comes over and goes to pin three over here so I've just reset it so it's blinking once per second as it did before if I hold down the blink faster button then eventually it'll get to the point where it's blinking where the delay is 100 milliseconds so it'll be blinking five times a second if I hold down the blink slower button then it'll slow down like that now you'll notice one problem here and that is that the way the software is written it only reads the buttons at the end of the off time just before it turns back on again so there's issues there with that uh, it you you have to basically hold the button down it can't you, you, you can't click it quickly and expect it to read the other problem is that when it's blinking quickly it responds quickly when it's blinking slow you have to hold the thing down for a long time to get it to speed back up again uh, because it only does a, a hundred milliseconds every time you click it. Okay, I've now made some changes to the uh, software and re-uploaded it. I'll show you the changes in a moment, but I first want to show you what they do. Uh, now what it does is you have to click it once for each uh, increase or decrease in the time that you want. Uh, holding it down doesn't do anything anymore. Uh, well, holding down does one uh, each time you click it does one thing holding it down doesn't make it keep doing those things uh, so if I click this a bunch of times really quick it really f quickly gets up to blinking fast and if I click this one it immediately slows back down again so it's just so that's, that's a little bit better behavior than what we had before. Now here's what I did in order to do that. We're going to have this, which is our first function that we're writing. Now it still doesn't return anything, it still says void, but it's taking, this is called an argument. Uh, it's a value that's passed into it that tells this function what the caller wants it to do. In this case, it wants it to delay for this many milliseconds. Uh, now, what this also does is all of our button code and our milliseconds changing is now happening inside of here, and our main loop is back down to being pretty much what it was before other than it's calling my delay now instead of just delay. Um, so what it's doing inside of here is it has this. Now this, static int, static is another keyword that we're learning here. Static is, this function, this, this value is still inside this function. It's only used by this function. Uh, but if the static wasn't here, then this value would be set back to high every time you came back into this function. With static here, uh, it's only set once and then it's left alone. Uh, if something in this function changes it, it stays changed. So then what we do is we come down here and remember before it only uh, read the buttons at the end of a delay cycle. 
Well, what we're doing now is we're chopping up our delay cycle by quite a lot. Instead of delaying a thousand milliseconds or whatever it's set to, we're delaying 10 milliseconds at a time, and then we're subtracting 10 from the number of milliseconds that we still have to delay. And then we're checking our buttons and doing whatever we have to do with the buttons. And we come back up again, we do another 10, 10 milliseconds, subtract off another 10 milliseconds, and we keep doing that while milliseconds is greater than zero. So as soon as milliseconds goes back down to zero, we've delayed the right number of milliseconds, and we drop out the bottom here, come back down to here, to the collar, do the next thing, and then come back up into here again. Uh, now our button code is also changed a little bit. Instead of just directly reading it, we since we're calling since we're doing this a hundred times a second, uh, we have to. We don't want it to. If you press the button down for a tenth of a second, you don't want it to think you press the button ten times. So what we're doing is we're reading the value of the button, same as we did before. But then we do this thing, which is says if the value now, button one now, is not equal to the value that we remembered from before. Button one pause, which is our static value up here, we're going to keep track of which position is, whether the button was pressed or not, last time we came through here. So we see what the button is like, is doing now, and we say if it's doing something different, then go into here. And if what it's doing now is that it's low, then we know that it's different and it's now low. It was high before somebody just pressed it. So then we go in here and we do whatever it is that we do when a button gets pressed. And then we set the historical button one position to the current value of pressed. Now the next time it comes through here, it'll say, oh, button one's still pressed, and this thing will say, yeah, but it was pressed before, so we don't care. And it'll just skip all of the stuff. And this does exactly the same thing with the second button. So that that's how we achieve that. And that's pretty much uh, what I'm going to do for this lesson. Uh, there are other considerations that you may hit even with simple push buttons. One of them is what's called debouncing. Uh, you won't have a problem when you're delaying 10 milliseconds. 10 milliseconds, believe it or not, is a heck of a long time when you're talking about microcontrollers. Um, but if you're reading a switch very, very fast uh, on the order of microseconds, uh, or maybe even one millisecond, uh, switches don't just Switches don't just close cleanly and then open cleanly. Mechanical switches uh, are pieces of metal and when they close, they don't just do this and then they'll do this. They close and, and they bounce a little bit and vibrate because there's springs in there. And so if you're, if for instance, this was a button that was part of a keyboard, you press that keyboard button and you might get if it's an A you might get three or four or ten A's because it vibrated uh, that many times and the microprocessor is fast enough to see all those vibrations so what you have to do is you have some sort of usually it's it's almost always a time delay where you have to see the if you're looking at it say 10,000 times a second you need to see it, you, you have to just work, uh, work out what works for you. Perhaps you'll say, it needs to be in the same state for 50 times in a row before I'll pay attention to it. That lets, gives it time to settle down and stop, stop bouncing. Again, we're waiting 10 milliseconds. 10 milliseconds is relatively forever uh, for this, and that's plenty of time for it to stop bouncing. So that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching.